I'm Chanley Bryan with the Center for Professional Development, um, that which used to be known as Career Services. And I'd like this to be as interactive of a session as possible. Um, I've just passed out some workshop evaluations. I've barely started talking, so there's no need to fill that out just yet. Um, but what I'd really appreciate is a lot of comments at the bottom just on ideas and suggestions. And I think, um, obviously, we can see today that there's a tremendous interest in thinking about your future as a career in science. And I can't tell you how happy I am to see that. Um, I've worked with Kathy Weaver here for 10 years on and off now. Um, I used to be director of career services at Thayer and recently returned to, to school about, after about six years away, um, during which time I co-wrote a book on um, Twitter called the Twitter Job Search Guide on how to have conversations with employers. And I'm thrilled to be back on campus. And I've got a new task, which I'm going to ask for all of your help on. And that is that we, um, as an office, have reorganized. And so each of the advisors has a division that we'll be working with specifically to, to focus on programs like this so that we can make sure that we're meeting your needs and your curiosities and helping you reach out and connect with our 36,000 alumni, many of whom are in science. Um, so I will be forming an advisory board. If anyone's interested in learning more about that, please come see me this afternoon because I'd love to talk to you. Um, and just really want to open this up. So I've got some material prepared. But again, I want you to ask me any questions or share thoughts and ideas as I talk. And, and please feel free um, to come up afterwards as well. Any, anything that you want to make sure you know about my office before you leave? Does everyone know where I'm located? OK. I'll cover that too. Um, so today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about how you can prepare to share your information. I'm going to talk a little bit about developing resumes and cover letters specifically for STEM jobs. Um, one of the things I want to mention is um, we hear a lot in our office about um, finance, about careers in finance. People see recruiters coming to campus. They think that's what we're all about. We're about helping people get a lot of jobs. But one of the things I want to tell you that I haven't heard students say, but which is absolutely true, is of the 10 top paying fields, eight are in science and technology. And there's a huge demand for all of you. And I think it's really easy. Um, I'm going to make a stereo some stereotypes right now. Um, and I'm going to say that I'm qualified. I'm going to call myself qualified to do that because this is my 10th year um, working in the Ivy League, and I've also worked at Penn, and I've also worked at Columbia. And I think that we have a remarkable ability when we're here to make ourselves feel small and to feel awkward in terms of our self-esteem or where we are in our science. And there's a big difference between being prepared and to take a class and feeling confident and doing well in that. And I think it's important that we recognize that. Sometimes if you, if you have a tough time in a class, it may be because you didn't come to Dartmouth ready to take on that class. And there are support resources and help available for you. But I also want you to recognize that difference and to also recognize that every day that you are at a top ranked school in the entire country for science. And we're delighted you're here. So I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge that. Um, I think this morning was a great kickoff in terms of talking, learning more about how to talk about your science so that everyone understands. And one of the things that we've done in our office is we've just created a brand new resume guide. How many of you have been able to take a look at that yet? OK, so I'm going to pick on you. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, well, I was just mainly using it to um, prepare my resume for summer internships. Uh -huh. And um, it was really useful because I was able to look at the resume guide, but I also was able to email in my resume. Yes. And, and we prefer that you actually, um, that you come in and get our feedback. And we have drop-in appointments every, every week, um, five times a week, where you can come in and you can meet with an advisor for 15 minutes and get help on your resume or cover letter. We, you can also make appointments with us. Um, but the resume guide has examples specific to science um, and, and applying in different industries. And we give you a little bit of a taste of 
um, how to write a CV as well, because of course, if you're applying for positions in academia um, and you're in graduate school, you'll want to have a CV as well, which, um, which is slightly different in terms of the rules. A resume, you generally are limited to one page. A CV, you can go on forever, unfortunately. Um, so <laughs> it still needs some editing, um, but it's not unusual, I think, for our faculty to have CVs that are 30, 40 pages in length. Um, use a lot of paper. So um, anyway, in, in terms of presenting your, your experience online, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to monitor and influence your Google search results. And the reason I want to talk about that today is because when you Google yourself, you get different results than what other people see when they Google you. Um, and that's because Google knows what we search for. You know, that, that's why if you search for a pair of shoes and then you find them and you buy them somewhere else, you may still see them online for the next five days. So these companies know what we're looking for. So I want to teach you some ways that you can go out and, and evaluate your information and see what other people are finding out about you. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about sharing with care and how to, how to build a positive online presence and start conversations. Um, because one of the things I think is really important is sharing your science with other people. Because the things you're doing are helping to change the world and they're helping to improve the quality of our lives and we appreciate it. So with that, um, our office is on the second floor of the Bank of America building right next to the Nugget. Um, a great place to go if you're also in the mood for gelato because you can come into our office, meet with someone and have some gelato on your way out if you'd like. Um, not that we're able to provide that for free. I wish we were. Um, so we're open from Monday to Friday from 8.30 to noon and then from 1 to 5. Um, you can now schedule a, appointments with individual advisors directly through Dartboard, which is our on-campus recruiting application, as well as just our central information repository. Um, so Dartboard is available to all students. Um, we're also opening it up to faculty so that um, faculty who advise students can go in and they can see the same internships that you see, um, and as well as, as full-time positions. And um, we have space available for group meetings, conference rooms, and stu student organized panel programs. So for example, if you have an idea for, some, for a workshop on your area of interest or on a professional topic, you can feel free to call us and I will work with you to create that program. And we have a, a workshop room in our facility that can seat 35 easily. We also have eight interviewing rooms um, in our facility that can be used for study groups or small, um, small group discussions if you need a place for that. You just need to ask us in advance and we need to make sure they're not being used for interviewing because a lot of companies come to campus because they want to see you and they want to hire you, which is nice. Um, for resume and cover letter help, I recommend you go to Dartboard. Again, this is um, available through our main website, which is just dartmouth.edu um, slash tilde CSRC. Um, which was our old name, so we're, we're in the process, again, of shifting from career services to the Center for Professional Development. But um, through Dartboard, you can see our um, resume guide as well as our cover letter guide, and we just, um, this week, rolled out a networking guide as well. So we're really um, trying to focus on getting you this information so that you can access it at any time. And with that, um, I'm pleased to announce that we have a new um, service available through our website. There's a little button that says help and feedback and that is a mechanism by which we are trying to provide 24-hour support. We've built a knowledge base in and we also have a place for you to share your ideas very much like Improved Dartmouth. Um, so we encourage you to go to that site um, and ask us questions and we'll get back to you quickly that way. That helps us communicate. And we're just starting that, and I'll be presenting on that at three, in three weeks at a conference, and I need more data. So if you could do anything for me today, it would be to go to that site um, and follow up with a question or anything that you, you'd like help with. So I wanted to talk briefly about essential elements of the STEM resume. Um, in general, employers will want to get a sense of your coursework and your lab techniques. And traditionally, that information often, um, the lab techniques, 
often rested at the bottom of the resume. Um, I've recently gotten certified in a technique used by 70% of the Fortune 500 to find candidates, and I've learned how important it is to put the relevant keywords towards the top of your resume. So I think it's important when you're applying for a position um, in developing a resume to put those lab techniques or the things that are mentioned, asked for in the job description in the top of your descriptions. Um, as well as, as um, in your introductions for a resume, and we can, again, help you with that. Um, just as, as you created and refined your elevator pitch this morning, you really want to think about your experience in terms of your research goal and how it could impact society, and put that information in your resume. Because how many of you will be applying for jobs that are different than what you're studying right now? The majority of you should be. So, because we want, especially want you to expand your odds of getting a position too. So, I think it's really important to think about the long term impact that your research could have or the overall context of that. And we can help you do that. And so can your faculty as well. Um, and again, you want to simplify the science. The, the rule that I, of thumb that I generally um, use is. Can you explain it to your grandmother or your most clueless friend? Um, so think about how you want to talk about what you do. And I think today's elevator pitch was a great experience to get that peer-to-peer -peer feedback. And when you're feeling uncomfortable and not sure of how to answer questions or how to present yourself, yourself don't hesitate to ask your friends because I think as we discovered this morning, they often have some really useful ideas um, that can help you. Um, because as, as one of my favorite authors said, you know, why is it that we spend our entire lives with ourselves, but we can't tell, tell what we look like? You know, why is it that the first person you look for in a group photo is yourself? You know, you know what you look like, right? You should. But it's really hard to talk about your experience, and, and that's okay. We're here to help you with that. Um, couple brief differences between the resume and the cover letter. In general, a resume is a third person document. Um, me and my are not allowed. You want to give us your work history, your skills, the basic details, your job location when you've done it, and the size of, and scope of your responsibilities and, and potential accomplishments. A cover letter is more of a conversation of how your skills and experience fit that job. You also want to talk about how you found the organization. If you know someone, if you've had a conversation with them before, you want to share that. And you want to give that information. Um, and unless specified, you generally need a resume and a cover letter to apply to jobs, internships, and research opportunities. Um, so just in general, something to think about. When you write a cover letter, um, they may be the most awkward things in life. Um, I think I've worked with about 5,000 students over the course of my career, and I've met approximately 10 that enjoy writing them. They're not fun. But what I want you to remember when you do it is that your resume is your backbone. It's got your information. They're going to see that in tandem, so there's no need to repeat your entire life story. Um, when a recruiter is hiring, I, I can say this because I've worked as a recruiter, they're generally hiring for more than one position at a time. Or if a hiring manager is the only person who's, go who's managing the search process, they're also usually doing their job at the same time. So an easy way to write a cover letter is to think about what the job is and repeat it to the employer. Because they may have forgotten, true story, when I, when I got my job at the University of Pennsylvania, when they were writing me my offer letter, they went into their library, pulled up the Chronicle of Higher Education, looked for their ad to remember what they asked for. So, you know, it, it really is important to, you can just simply say, you know, I understand you're looking for um, an undergraduate major in chemistry um, with a knowledge of these lab techniques. This is what I offer you. Um, also, if you don't have something, um, you can, you can go ahead and just cut to the chase. So for example, one time I was working with a student who was applying for an internship at a hospital, 
and he had a second paragraph of his cover letter that was about this long. It took up almost the whole page. And every single sentence started with, I, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And I said, I, you know, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on here? And he said, well, I'm applying for a position that always goes to rising seniors because they want you to complete your pre-medical coursework requirements. But I've already completed those courses. So I said, you know, let's keep it simple. Just say, I understand this usually goes to a senior, but I've com completed all my pre-medical course requirements and I hope you'll consider me anyway. So it's, you can keep it that simple. Think about it as a conversation. Um, again, you want to think about what the employer should know about you and why specifically you are interested in the position. So how you heard about the job is important. Um, because they want to know how their advertising's working, um, how you fit the position, and what you bring to it, just one or two examples that, um, where you've demonstrated those skills, and finally, why you're interested. And I think why you're interested is really important because as professors select you and as employers look at you, they are as nervous about hiring as you are about getting a job because they want to find the right person for the opportunity. So you want to take time to tell them where that is. And one of the nice things about being at Dartmouth is that we have world-class resources in research. Um, so if you come in to see us, we can show you how you can mine the library research guides. And Laura can as well. She was here earlier this morning. Uh, because I can generate reports, and you can too, that cost $800 on the market in 30 seconds or less. Um, because the library subscribes to that kind of information. So you can get first-rate information to prepare for interviews and, and to show employers that you have an understanding of what they do, and that can also help you clarify what you want to study as well. Um, again, I, I'm sorry for just uh, going through that slide very fast, but that was Dartboard. Again, that was our site where there's, there are internships. And actually, I'm going to go back there if I can. Uh, let me see. Go to slide. Let me go here because I want to highlight. Oops, I don't know exactly what's going on. Let's see. Seems to be on autopilot. Okay. So when you go into Dartboard, you'll see a lot of different arrows. Um, and under more jobs and internships, we have something called the Internship Feedback Network. And so for those of you who are undergraduates and who are looking for opportunities, there are 1,100, over 1,100 positions that have been student reviewed with examples in this part of our website. So you can get their feedback. And in many cases, they have their contact information as well. So if you haven't found something yet for the summer, that's a really good place to start. And we can help you with that if you're still looking for the summer. So now I'm going to talk about online resume reputation management. But before I do that, do you have any questions on the resumes and cover letters? Anything at all? OK, so we'll go on. So with online reputation management, as far as what people um, can find out about you online, I like to think of it as a three-step process. First, you want to know what's being said about you or what comes up in a search. Um, secondly, you want to try to influence that information. And finally, you want to be selective about the tools you use and how you share the information as a whole. Um, the first thing you want to do is you want to know your Google search results. How many of you have searched your name on Google? Great. <laughs> how many of you found stuff that surprised you? Do you want to share with us what that was? Like, I found like an award I got in like high school or something like that. And there's another town and I'm not from like that claimed I was from there and I got it like for their town or something, but I'm not from there. <laughs> <laughs> any any other weird information that you discovered about yourselves online? Yes. Um growing like my discus result from being on like my middle school track team. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so ideally you want, to, you want at least the top one, or, uh, one to three of the top five results to be about things that you've done professionally. Um, and an easy way to do that is through LinkedIn. 
But if you search um, Google, one of the things that you can find if you use the search tools is to basically, you can, um, if you go to search tools then, and then use the drop down menu there, there's an option called verbatim. And what verbatim shows you is what other people find when you find information. And you can also, of course, use this for your own research purposes or as you do classwork or anything in Google if you just feel like you're only getting results that Google wants you to see. Yes? Well, most other people get different results based on who they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Because as I mentioned earlier, Google knows in anyone's search patterns. Do you do it in general? Like, for me, we can do generalized view, but like, you know, like, for example, like, you might have like some differences, like, regardless of the Well, but what verbatim does is it strips all that out. So it's like, that's just like It's just like your straight data. And one of the things that I love, and it, it doesn't work here um, because I'm, I just am so unique, but um, <laughs> is that um, there, this little drop box right here on any Google address, has anybody ever used it? Yeah. You want to talk about what's in there? Similar search results. Similar search results. Do you want to talk about similar search results? Uh, if you're searching for a company and you use the drop down box you can find similar organizations and that can help you widen your search so it's always good to apply to more than one opportunity and just simply using that similar search piece can really help you expand your options and and see additional search results that you might not have found otherwise so that's a tool that we use another um, place that I think is really important to evaluate, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, I'm sure your parents may have told you this or other, you've heard it um, ad nauseum, but is Facebook. And secure.me is an application that will allow you to just sign up for it and you give it permission to scan through your Facebook information, your posts, and it will identify things that it, it thinks could get you into trouble. Um, I, people ask me if it's safe to have even if you, well, how do I say this? The question I get asked a lot is how safe is my Facebook if I really mine the protection? And I still don't trust it completely. And so what I recommend is, and, and I feel like for the most part, most employers do not screen out people out based on Facebook, but it can happen and it has been known to happen. The good thing, the good news is, that more employers now will hire you because of what they find online, the positive information. Um, but it's important to know about the content. And secure.me can help you just monitor your Facebook account. Um, in terms of mentions of your name, you can also set up a Google News Alert, which will send you information anytime your name hits the wires. And one of the things that I think is most important is knowing what other people with your name are doing. So, for example, I have a friend named Boris Johnson. Um, Boris is kind of an unusual name. He goes by Vo. He works at the Department of Justice in Washington. He has a law degree. There's another Boris Johnson in Washington, but he's on death row because he killed someone. So Vo needs to, you know, that doesn't come up a lot, of course, because nobody would be working with Vo if he was on death row anyway, but it's good for him to just know so that he can comment about that. Um, yes. Um, do you have any suggestions? Because I'm a person who is there. I have a very unique name, and there's someone with my exact name, similar age, does very weird, wildly illegal things, and posts them online. And I don't know how to like make sure people know that she's not me. Like, do you have any suggestions for that? Come and see me. Come and see me, and we can also talk about that in in your LinkedIn profile. You can actually make a joke about it, and I think that's fine. Are you guys Facebook friends? Have you ever talked? Or? No, but she has like this old MySpace about all the drugs that she does. And like, <laughs> she, has, she doesn't use it, but it's still out there. And it's like one of the first things that pops up when you Google my name. And I'm like, it's not me. Well, and, and what might be useful is, is to maybe have a conversation with her at some point. You know, if you can approach her. 
um, you know, in a friendly way and just say, hey, we have the same name. It's, if, it seems like she's pretty open to things, experimenting new things. Maybe she'd want to talk to you and have a conversation. And maybe you could just tell her that, you know, you were applying for a job and this MySpace po site popped up and say, hey, do you use that anymore? Not do you use the drugs, but, you know, <laughs> do you still use that? If not, you know, would you mind taking it down after you've established a rapport, of course. So, so those are all things you can do. Anybody else have any similar awkward moments online? Yes. There is someone else with my exact name that like, like is doing like kind of similar work to like what I was doing, except for she's like older than me, so she does definitely like, the 80s when I like wasn't alive. But like, so like if I like like look up my like like you know like journal articles, there's someone else with my name that's like doing things that are like not that far from what I would be doing. So it's like, kind of weird. I don't know. So what what are you studying? <laughs> Your biology. So, yeah, okay. Like, like, well, that's not a bad thing, yeah, yeah. but but you still, you know, again, that's something you may want to clarify. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions or thoughts on stuff like that? Anyone using Secure.me right now to check through things? Okay. So why is social media important in job search? I want to talk a little bit about the different habits of recruiters. And unfortunately, um, there are usually what I say to students is don't worry about the recruiters. They are not searching for you yet, you know, proactively. We have, we have several hundred recruiters that come to campus annually. They post positions. They come on campus to interview people. In many, for many other entry level jobs, they simply wait to post a job and wait to receive applications. It's different in science. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be working with you, is that people will be looking for you. And so that's why it's especially important to think about your online presence because 94% um, of companies say they already use or are planning to use social media in their recruiting processes. So there are a lot of employers who are online and it's often a really good way to get through to employers and have direct conversations in part because what you say is very transparent. So for example, if you're a senior and you're applying for a job, let's say at Merck, and you haven't heard back from Merck, there are probably five recruiters from Merck on Twitter. And if you send an at reply to any one of them or a message, they will see that. And so will any of the rest of the world that's searching on Merck or jobs. And so they have a responsibility to reply to that because they want to look responsive to you. And that can also make you a more three-dimensional candidate because you go from being a name on paper to being someone who's actively reached out and started a conversation. So social media can be a very powerful tool in looking for positions. Um, in general, especially for those of you who have other people sharing your names, you want to build a presence on big sites that get a lot of traffic. LinkedIn is in the top 10 sites uh, that are most frequently accessed online in general. Um, in many industries, people spend an hour average of uh, an hour or two a week just using LinkedIn. It's like the Facebook of the, of the corporate world and has been for many years and just seems to keep exploding into other realms. There are over 15,000 Dartmouth alums who are members of the Dartmouth alumni group alone. So it's a really useful site. Yes? Do you feel like it hurts you if you like, for example, the type of person that has like a Facebook and a LinkedIn but like not a Twitter? Like, no, it doesn't hurt you at all. And, and one of the things I want you to understand about social media, if you remember nothing else, is that you should use it in the ways that you feel comfortable with. You know, if you don't feel comfortable at all using Twitter, or you don't feel comfortable using Facebook, or you don't want to connect with an employer on Facebook, that's okay. It really is. Other questions? Yes. So, <clears throat> I'm on LinkedIn, and I... Uh, definitely gotten requests for connections from like my personal friends, uh -huh. which I don't accept because I feel like LinkedIn is not Facebook and you shouldn't be making connections with personal friends, not like work friends. Actually, it's 
quite the com contrary. I would say, except your um, LinkedIn was basically created on the idea that you should um, connect with Spark. It, it was basically connected based on the idea of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but within three degrees. <laughs> so for example, if I know Kathy, and Kathy knows Catherine, and I'm trying to get to Catherine, I can find Catherine through Kathy, and Kathy can introduce us. So you actually want to connect to your friends, and it doesn't matter if they're in a different discipline. Okay. What you don't want to do is connect to completely random strangers who can email you out of the blue and who you have no context with, and you don't want to just send out invitations to alums who you have no connection with um, without saying something about why you'd like to have a conversation with them. So similar, similarly off that, um, I get requests for connections from people who I've never met, but work at companies and for NGOs who I might want to work for in the future. Should I add them as a connection? Yes, especially if they're, if they're inviting you to join. What I would do is I would add them as a connection, but then I would have a conversation with them. You know, so I would start a dialogue. I would say, thank you so much for finding me. You know, I'm just curious, how did you discover me? Um, you know, I'd love to have a conversation and learn a little bit more about you, what you do, or you've really been on my radar. <laughs> um, I'm excited to hear from you. You know, can, can we talk further? That, that's exciting. <laughs> Other questions? Um, LinkedIn has a fabulous tool for researching alumni connections. You can even see um, how many people in Chicago are working in um, engineering, for example. And it's, it's unbelievable. Um, have any of you used this tool? Great. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because I love introducing you. Um, but basically, if you go into LinkedIn under interest or you, you search LinkedIn alumni and type in Dartmouth, you can explore the careers of all of our alumni who have LinkedIn profiles. So all you have to do is click the more button and you can see what, people, what other people have done and how they've presented themselves. So there are, I think, over 240 million members of LinkedIn now. And if you're tongue-tied when you're writing your resume, or thinking about how you further revise your elevator pitch, you can see how they're presenting, many of these people are presenting themselves in their own summaries. So this is incredibly useful. You can also see, you know, if, if you're going to a city for a conference, you can see what alums are there, um, how many work for particular employers. It's, it's an incredible way to make connections and, and do research. And I and, this, and my colleagues and the um, Center for Professional Development are happy to meet with you and show you how to use this tool effectively. And just simply by joining the Dartmouth College alumni group, you can get um, all of the contact information for those 15,000 alums in that circle. So you can send them, you can go into the group and you can see the members and then you can send a message without inviting them to connect, which I think is, the, is a more elegant way of getting your information across. And one of the things that LinkedIn allows you to do is to customize your own profile URL. Can anyone talk about what that is? Has anyone done that? Okay, so basically LinkedIn allows you to create a shortcut. To, you know, so for example, I'm Chanley Bryan, it's a unique name, no one else has my name. So I was able to put Chanley Bryan in as my LinkedIn profile name. And now at the bottom of all my emails, I can say linkedin.com slash in slash my name. And that's an automatic direction to get to my LinkedIn profile. So it's a, a really easy way to reach out for networking and just use a URL instead of attaching a resume. I think it's a lot less awkward and it gives people just as easy of a way to get your information across. So that's something I recommend. Um, finally, I'm going to share with you a few strategies for what I call um, sharing your information with care. So um, communicating in such a way that you can build relationships, reputation, and facilitate understanding. Um, so there are a couple things that I 
recommend in general, but the strategy I'm going to share with you today um, I call the AIM model. And that's basically how to think about communicating information in your best light. So, for example, I had a, fr um, it, it's sort of like thinking about your awkward moments and how to get through those and how to get help because social media is so useful at getting that information. So let's say, for example, you are going to move to a new city um, with some friends. You want to work, you know the industry you want to work in, but you don't know how to get in touch with people. Um, you want to, instead of just posting a message to an overall group, you want to think about the audience that can help you the most. And that may be a scientific professional society, for example, because a lot of professional societies have local chapters with people that, that are actively employed and working and, and engaged and can help you network in a particular area. But you want to think about your audience. You want to think about what you want to convey. Because in general, after you graduate, um, it's not a great idea to just say on your LinkedIn profile, I'm unemployed. It's better to say what you're studying, what you've studied, what you hope to be doing. Um, and so you want to convey that information in a positive light and you want to tailor that information for your audience. And the example I'm going to give um, actually comes from a friend of mine who got in trouble. This, he was actually late to work. Um, and his, he was working at a very prominent consulting firm in New York. And his boss said, this is a problem. And so instead of saying, I'm really in a rough spot because of um, my tardiness. I don't know how to fix it. I'm an idiot. He basically went online and said, essentially, I need some strategies for getting to bed earlier. What are your ideas? And he asked his friends. And so I think that that's a great way to you know, get help with a problem without saying the, what the entire problem is or assigning adjectives <laughs> to show how you're feeling about it. So basically, um, you know, you can, you can go public with your awkward moment if you phrase it in the right way, get ideas, and tailor your message. Any questions on that or thoughts? Okay. So here's another example is, is um, how to get a referral for a position. So if you have a friend who has an inside connection and you need to secure an introduction, um, you could write a simple message that basically checks in with the person, mentions a commonality that you have or some information, you know, a follow up with them to express interest in them because it's always going to be a two way conversation and then ask for their help and let them know that you're willing to help them back. Because reciprocity and being as open to giving help as to receiving can help you really build strong relationships. So that, those are my suggestions for that. Other questions about online identity or how to present yourself? Yes? Personal websites are great, especially if it's information that you don't mind sharing with the world. You know, I, I think sometimes what I recommend is, is controlling um, controlling some of your access information. Like, for example, I wouldn't put my address, my, my mailing address on a personal website just for, just for privacy's sake. Um, but I think personal websites can be great. And especially in the sciences, if you have a portfolio that showcases your work, that can help you get employed. And we can help you develop your portfolios as well. So. Um, so that's my basic information for today. Again, I would love your, your feedback and your ideas for suggestions on science-related or really any professional development-related programming that we can do. Um, I will be here for the rest of the day, so please feel free to come up and have a chat. And uh, I look forward to getting to know many of you. Thanks.